Well, my walk calendar at home says today is Palm Sunday. No, I'm not so sure about that because I can't find a date for Palm Sunday in my Bible. But my walk calendar at home also says next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And I'm not sure about that either because uh, we don't acknowledge holidays here to the goddess Ishtar in this church. And we don't uh, color Easter eggs and have Easter egg hunts and do Easter baskets in this church. We do celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Every week when we come together, the reason we meet on Sunday is because the Lord Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And so we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord every Sunday when we come together. That's why we meet on Sunday. That said, however, I did decide today to bring a somewhat of a Palm Sunday message. And I'm going to be preaching about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So the message in your bulletin is titled, The Triumphal Entry, question mark. It may be more appropriately titled, Den of Thieves. Or even better, where is your fruit? So you can pick a title, one of those three. The triumphal entry, Den of Thieves, or where is your fruit? I'm going to be touching on all those subjects. Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to begin reading. We're going to go through actually much of this chapter together. We're going to begin reading right in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they and were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives. Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tithe and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. I want you to keep your finger here and go back a few books to the book of Zechariah, because I want you to see the context here in Zechariah. The context here, Zechariah is prophesying against various neighbors of Israel here in chapter 9. And as is many times the case, a lot of these messianic prophecies that are clearly about the Lord Jesus, such as his virgin birth, and here we have, we're talking about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And many of the, the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, when you look at their context, there's, uh, the context has nothing to do with, with the Lord Jesus, but they're, they're set in that particular type of context in, in, many, in many places. But here we see that in Zechariah chapter 9, Verse 9 is where Matthew is quoting from, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the colt, the foal of an ass. And I will, this next verse, Matthew didn't quote, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. God is saying, I'm going to bring peace to Israel. They're not going to need their implements of war anymore. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Well, both of those verses are messianic prophecies. But Matthew only cited verse 9, in chapter 21 of Matthew, it's very similar to where when the Lord Jesus began his ministry and he was given a scroll to read. It was a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Turn over to, keep your finger in Matthew 21. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. The point is there's a long span of time between those two verses, between when one is fulfilled and when the other one will be fulfilled, just as there is here in Isaiah chapter 61. I'm turning the wrong way in my Bible. Isaiah 61. I went too far. I went past it. Isaiah 61, verse 1. When Jesus was in the synagogue and they gave him the scroll to read, and it says, and he found the place in the scroll where it was written. 
Verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are blind or bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now that's where the Lord Jesus stopped quoting. But the passage goes on, and it says, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now see, the, Jesus stopped at the point where he was going to fulfill that prophecy. The day of vengeance is still to come. Just as in the book of Zechariah, God is, will restore peace to Israel, but he hasn't yet. That day is still yet to come. So that's the context of, this, of the prophecy here. There's, a, there's going to be a passage of time, a space of time between when Jesus comes into Jerusalem at his triumphal entry and the time when he actually does bring peace to Jerusalem. And the day will come, though, point is that, as Zechariah said, the day will come when the Lord Jesus will have dominion from sea to sea on this earth and from the river even to the ends of the earth. It doesn't say heaven. It says to the ends of the earth. Jesus will reign on this earth one day. That day is going to come. So Zechariah said he is just in having salvation. Just meaning he is without sin. He is without sin, yet bringing God's solution for sin. As Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes he were healed. He was just in bringing salvation. He was without sin, yet he brought salvation for our sins. He was without sin and he rides into Jerusalem bringing redemption and reconciliation for those who are bound by sin. And though they are not praising him for that reason in this context, it is for that reason that he is worthy of praise. Zechariah also says that Christ is lowly, humble. He's humble and meek, as Matthew quoted. It's understood at this time when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem only by Christ himself that he is presenting himself publicly for the sole purpose of subjecting himself to public humiliation on the cross, to public shame, humiliation of the cross. That's his purpose for riding into Jerusalem. He only knows that. But that's what he's coming into the city for. His humiliation is not in any way diminished by the praise he receives. Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought of not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. He is meek and lowly, riding on the foal of an ass. By the way, you know, if Jesus was willing to go to the cross and suffer for our sins, ought not we be willing to serve him with our lives, amen, with our time, the answer is yes, we ought to be able to do that. It's our reasonable service, Paul says in Romans chapter 12. So back to Matthew 21, verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them and brought the ass and the colt and put on, put on their clothes, put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, turn over, uh, let's look at Luke's account of this event in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I want to cite verses 37 through 40, and then we'll make a few observations here we want to point out. Luke says in verse 37 of chapter 19, when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Observation number one here is that the Lord Jesus' humility is in no way diminished by His acceptance of their praise and worship of which He is worthy. The Pharisees who knew that Christ was by nature a meek and a humble man, a humble person, expected Christ to rebuke His disciples. Jesus acknowledges, though, that He is worthy of to be praised, because He is the great I Am. And He does have the name that is above all names, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Because only God is worthy of worship, and Jesus acknowledges that He is God by accepting their worship. That's why Jesus said, by the way, in John chapter 5, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Jesus said he's worthy of the same honor and the same praise that the Father receives. And so he received their praise. And he was, he was worthy of it. It says in Revelation chapter 5, we see the angels of God and all of, all of heaven worshiping the Lord Jesus because he is worthy of worship and praise. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, John says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That is millions and billions of beings worshiping the Lord. And it says, saying with a loud voice. Notice verse 12, Revelation 5, saying with a loud voice. They were shouting in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The Lord Jesus is worthy of our praise and worship. He accepted their praise. And worship on that day because he's worthy of the same honor due the Father. So back to Luke chapter 19. Note how the praises of the Jerusalem crowd here are somewhat similar actually to the praises of the angels at Christ's birth. In Luke chapter 2, it says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Both glorified God in the highest. And both gave the Father glory for sending His Son. Both spake of the peace that He would bring. As did Zechariah. But the peace that Jesus brought was first peace with God. Reconciling man to God. But later on, as I said, there will be peace on this earth as well. And that will come. The new world order will be put down. The Lord Jesus will reign. Amen. And as Zechariah said, and He shall speak peace unto the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Notice that whether men praise the Lord Jesus or not, he will and shall and must be praised. Luke 19, 39, Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. What did Jesus say? I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Interestingly, this was, just a few days later, literally fulfilled. When upon men's reviling Christ on the cross, when Christ's disciples had abandoned Him and basically gone into hiding, they had disbanded Him and shrunk Him into silence. The stones did then cry out. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. 
And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after His resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. The rocks did cry out. They did speak to that centurion loud and clear enough to turn him into a believer. Back to Luke 19. I want you to note the reason for their praise. In verse 37, it says, When he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Why? For all the mighty works that they had seen. They praised Him for feeding them. They praised Him for healing them. They praised Him for raising the dead as He had done to Lazarus just a few days prior to this in Bethany. They praised Him for what He had done for them. As well they should, and as well we should as well. But you know, some Christians seem to think that the Christian life is all about what I can get from God. That God is some kind of a genie in a bottle to answer all of our prayers. But we must also praise Jesus for who He is whether He answers our prayers or not. No matter if we get you know, our, our wishes fulfilled and our, our prayers answered, we must praise Him for the greatest act and the greatest gift, and that's this, this great salvation that He accomplished at the cross. That's, that alone is worthy of our eternal praise to Him. So note the reason for their praise, but also note the shallowness, the shallowness of their praise, the duplicity of their praise and the insincerity and the fickleness of this Jerusalem crowd. One day they shout, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. That's what they're shouting one day. But then just a few days later, they're shouting, Crucify Him. Crucify Him. Matthew 27, verse 17, Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will you that I release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. One day they say, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the king, the son of David. A few days later, as John records, Pilate said to the crowd, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. The fickleness of this crowd somewhat highlights the shallowness of their praise, does it not? How this happened? It says in verse 20, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude. I'm not sure how they did that. But it shows how the crowd or the mob can be easily led and duped by a few evil conspirators, doesn't it? I'm reminded of how Paul and Silas were treated in much the same way in Acts chapter 14, where it's in Acts 14, verse 13, where Paul and Barnabas had just healed some folks, and so the townspeople all wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. It says, And the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garlands into the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We are also men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, He left not Himself without witness in that He did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarcely they refrained, restrained the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. They wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas. 
That's up to verse 18. The very next verse in verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he'd been dead. One verse they want to worship him. But then come a few conspirators and persuade the crowd. Next, the next verse, they're stoning him, leaving for dead. The fickleness of the people. An entire mob, once again, easily led and duped by a few evil conspirators. One day they love you, the next day they hate you. The crowd loves you, by the way, as long as you serve the crowd and the mob. By the way, that's why so many preachers today in the pulpits are men pleasers, crowd pleasers. They care very little about pleasing the Lord. Truly serving God or doing what's right. I remind of Kent Hovind. He had a wonderful worldwide ministry for a while until he took a stand against the IRS and was called up publicly to suffer for it. And the Christian community, who should, by the way, have been taking the stand, same stand he took, or who at least should have respected him for ta- having the courage to take a stand like David alone against the giant when they stood there shaking in their boots, afraid to confront this giant, the IRS. Instead of supporting him, and at least respecting him, they turned on him and abandoned him. One day they love you, the next day they hate you. They stone you and leave you for dead. Well, back to Matthew chapter 21. I want to move on to the events of the, the later events of that day. After we get beyond the crowd and the praise, Jesus comes into Jerusalem in verse 9. And the multitudes... They went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Verse 10, when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. At the time this happened, the Lord Jesus knew that in just a few days, the veil of that temple was going to be rent in twain from top to bottom. He knew that in just a few years, that temple was going to be torn apart stone by stone. It was going to be destroyed. And yet he was still consumed with zeal for that holy place, for God's temple. Question for you. What kind of zeal do you think he has for his church today? If he had that kind of zeal for the temple that was soon to be destroyed, when he said the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, what kind of zeal does he have for his church today? If the Lord Jesus did this at the temple, what would He do if He walked into most churches today? What would He do? Churches that have sold out His Lordship so they can receive government subsidies via tax exemption. Churches that have taken the position that Caesar is a higher authority than God and therefore has authority to tax God's tithe. And therefore we have to beg Caesar for a tax exemption because he can tax God. What would Jesus say? Den of thieves. Churches that that have made the Internal Revenue Code a higher authority in the church in the Bible. Churches that have traded in being churches to instead become federal franchises and informants and tax collectors for the Antichrist. What would he say if he walked into into the normal church today? Churches that have for all practical purpose taken the mark of the beast upon their doors. Churches that teach their kids in their schools to pledge allegiance to the American flag first. And then, well, let's also we have to pledge allegiance to the Christian flag as well. We'll fly the Christian flag out front of our school, but we'll put the American flag on top of it. I'll tell you what he'd do if he walked into the church today. He would turn over the tables of the money changers. He'd say to them, it is written, my house should be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. He would say to them, repent, or I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He'd say to them, repent, or I'm going to withdraw your lampstand. I'm going to close you down. I'm going to shut down the lights in your house. 
By the way, you might just say, sorry, it's too late. I already spewed you out of my mouth. I've already withdrawn your lampstand. You have no more light. There's no light in you. Just as in Ezekiel's vision, I believe Ichabod is written over the doorposts of most churches today. Even so-called Baptist churches. who quit being Baptist a long time ago. Ichabod, the glory has departed. Their house is left to them desolate and they don't even know it. They have their great praise and worship programs. But their praise and worship is a farce because they really worship Caesar. My house should be called the house of prayer. But you made the den of thieves. Back to Matthew 21. Another important event the following day, starting verse 18. Now in the morning as he returned in the city, he hungered. When he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say, if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. In all things, in all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Some, most, look to this passage as a proof text for praying in faith, for having faith and not doubting. And as well we should, that's obviously the immediate point of Jesus' teaching here. But I think there's also another point to this story. We need to see here actually what may be the main point. And that is the Lord Jesus expects to see fruit on His trees. He wants fruit on His trees. Perhaps we all need to see ourselves as this, as this fig tree. When the Lord Jesus looks at you, what kind of fruit does He find? By the way, this is not a forced or a stretched application here at all. I think the Lord Jesus looks at us in much the same way He looked at that fig tree. I know that to be true, in fact, because turn to John chapter 15, please. It's in your bulletins. We, we, we cited it earlier. John chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and My Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may be that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. By the way, the word of God has a supernatural cleansing effect. If you got a problem with sin, get in God's word. God's word will cleanse you from sin popular saying, I, I believe it's true, says either sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. He said, you are clean, the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified. How? That ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. I think the Lord Jesus looks at us like he looked at that fig tree. When he looks at us, he expects to see fruit. So what kind of fruit are you bearing for Christ? Let's bring this home where the rubber meets the road. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, and a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. By the way, I, never, I can't think of a passage where Jesus talked about mediocre fruit. And there's two kinds of fruit. Good fruit and bad fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, just like that fig tree. 
and cast in the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. The Lord Jesus said there's two kinds of fruits, either good or bad. No, no mediocre, no in between. So what kind of fruit are you bearing? What kind of fruit am I bearing? Hopefully, if you're saved, if you're truly born again, you are bearing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Speaking of those who have been truly born again, Jesus said in John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 6, Jesus said this, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, but whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. He's saying here that, in other words, you, you can't see the wind, but you can see what the wind does to the tree. And if a person is truly born again, you can see the effects the Holy Spirit has in his life. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5.17, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. And if you're truly born again, then you've been transformed. And you ought to be producing good fruit. I'm almost done. I just want to look at three more passages dealing with good fruit versus bad fruit. Very quickly, just take me a couple minutes. Galatians chapter 5. Please turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5.19. What kind of fruit are you bearing? When the Lord Jesus looks at you, is He going to find fruit? I hope so. The Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. This is, this is bad fruit here. Works of the flesh, he's talking about bad fruit, the kind of fruit that a bad tree would bear. Works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That means anything goes. If it feels good, do it. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. But the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, now let's talk about the good tree and the good fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Verse 24, you should underline. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. Good fruit versus bad fruit. What kind of fruit are you bearing? Turn over, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. This, wasn't, this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, of the fruit of the Spirit. There's other fruits of the Spirit as well, including sanity, a sane mind. We're... We've not been given a spirit of fear, but a bit of power and of love and a sound mind. One fruit of the Spirit is a sound mind. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9 says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So what kind of fruit are you bearing? Turn one more, one more passage over to Romans chapter 6. Are you a good tree or a bad tree? Romans 6 verse 20. Talking about fruit here. Not much good fruit in the works of the flesh. Romans 6 verse 20. For when you were the servants of sin, meaning before you got born again, before you got saved, when you were the servants of sin, which we all were at one time, you were free from righteousness. You were free from righteousness. Then you could, if it feels good, do it. Foot loose, fancy free. But what fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. That's bad fruit. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So what kind of fruit are you bearing? When the Lord Jesus looks at you, what kind of fruit does he see? I'm going to tell you something. He cares. That's what that story was about. He cares about his trees bearing fruit. I want to tell you that if you are not bearing good fruit, you may be in danger 
of being hewn down and thrown in the fire, just as Jesus said. He meant that when He said it. If you're a bad tree bearing bad fruit, then you need to repent. You need to turn from your rebellion. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive Him as your Savior and Lord. Be born again today and become a good tree. He'll change you into a good tree. That's why the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away and all things become new. If you're not bearing fruit for Him, you need to. You need to repent today and turn to the Lord Jesus. Let's, uh, let's sing one more time. Let's sing that song, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. Grace greater than our sin.